extraordinary delight for me to be with you this morning again. I don't know if I am looking forward to the brown bag with trepidation. Maybe you can give me the answers to the questions that I have on the book of Ezekiel. As you know, the more deeply you plow into a subject or a text or whatever, the more problems you encounter. And so that was certainly the case as we were working on that. It is a joy to be with you. It's a joy especially to see on the platform today Dr. Hannah. He's the one that got me going on this. It's all his fault because he was my president for about six, seven years up in Winnipeg when we were at the front end of our uh, pilgrimage in terms of the ministry of teaching the Word. And I must say thank you to Dr. Hanna because at that institution, he, he as president created the kind of climate that encouraged the growth and development of faculty members. And I am very, very grateful. And my wife sends greetings as well. The joy of worship. These days, as soon as anyone announces a series of studies on worship, our ears perk up. This is no longer surprising since the evangelical church in America is presently engaged in what many may call the worship wars. Well, some are announcing victory, but I don't think that is, I think that's premature. In the past, churches have fought and divided over doctrinal issues like Calvinism versus Arminianism, over modes of baptism, over speaking in tongues, over head coverings and short sleeves on women's dresses. I can remember that debate in the church where I was growing up, long conversations at the dinner table over the ladies in the church, one of whom had her elbows showing in the service. These days, the battle, well, that was Saskatchewan. You need to keep warm, you know. <laughs> wasn't Texas. These days, the battle is over worship styles. In fact, some are arguing that commitments to certain styles of worship, we have our labels, contemporary versus traditional, are more important than devotional styles. And when people ask you today what kind of church you attend, chances are they're not asking whether you attend a Baptist or Lutheran or Methodist or Mennonite church. What they want to know is whether the church you attend is a seeker-sensitive church with all the baggage that goes with that, or whether it's a traditional church with all the baggage that goes with that. And the tensions in our congregations are very, very real. Our subject this morning is worship. Specifically, the joy of worship. As a basis for my reflections on this topic, I would like to look at a very boring text. It's at the beginning of what is arguably the most boring part of Scripture. That which scholars often call the Deuteronomic Law Code, or the Law Code of Deuteronomy. I'm convinced, and becoming more and more convinced every day as I work my way through this, that that is quite a misnomer, and that it is time we let the life begin to show that is in these texts. I'm going to read a rendering of this text before we start. These are the statutes and the judgments that you shall carefully observe in the land which the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has given you to possess as long as you live on the earth. You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations whom you must dispossess serve their gods, on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. You must tear down their altars and smash their sacred pillars and burn their asherim with fire. And you must cut down the carved images of their gods and obliterate their names from that place. You must not treat the Lord your God this way. But you may make pilgrimages to the place that the Lord your God will choose from all of your tribes to inscribe His name as the place for Him to reside. There you may come. There you may bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the contribution of your hand, your votive offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and your flock. There also you and your households may eat before the Lord your God, and there you may rejoice in, your, in all your efforts in which the Lord your God has blessed you. You must not do at all what we are doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes, for you have not as yet come to the resting place and the inheritance that the Lord your God is giving you. 
When you cross the Jordan and live in the land that the Lord your God is giving you as your grant, and He gives you rest from all your enemies around so that you live securely in them, then at the place in which the Lord your God will choose to establish His name, there you may bring all the offerings I command you, your burnt offerings and sacrificial meals, your tithes and the contributions of your hand, and all your choice votive offerings. And you may rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your sons and your daughters, your male and female servants, and the Levite who is within your gates, since he has not no portion or grant of land with you. Guard yourselves, lest you offer burnt offerings in any place you like, only at the place that the Lord your God chooses in one of your tribal allotments. There you may offer your burnt offerings, and there you must do all that I command you. This is the text that appears at the beginning of what is generally called the Deuteronomic Law Code. Actually, though, as you work your way through this, you will discover that Deuteronomy 12 to 26 bears a much closer resemblance to verse chapter 6 to 11 than it actually does to the Sinai documents, especially the Book of the Covenant, Exodus 20, 22 to 23, 33, on which much of it is based. In fact, there is no appreciable shift in style and tone as one moves from chapter 11 to chapter 12 and beyond. We have long recognized the homiletical and rhetorical tone of chapters 5 through 11. It's time we wake up to the fact that that tone does not change appreciably as we move into 12. While scholars are quick to recognize in the speeches of the book of Deuteronomy the voices of a prophet or a scribe or even a priest, the concerns and style of the speaker are better understood as the addresses of a pastor. One who knows that his own tenure as shepherd of Yahweh's sheep is about to come to an end. As pastor, Moses is concerned not only about civil and liturgical matters, but especially with the spiritual and physical well-being of the people. He expresses particular passion about the people's relationship with God. On the one hand, a relationship that is to be treasured as an incredible gift, and on the other hand, to be demonstrated in the life of grateful obedience to their divine Redeemer and Lord. Commentators tend to refer to this passage that I have read as the Deuteronomic Altar Law. Seeing here a late adaptation and revision of the original altar law in the book of the covenant, Exodus 20, 24 to 26. Now, there are, there's no denying there are obvious links between these two texts. But the label altar law is quite misleading on two counts. First, the focus of attention in this text is not on the altar. And second, this unit does indeed contain a series of commands, but as we shall see, to classify it as law is to obscure its pastoral tone and to drown out a remarkable grace that is hereby declared. A grace that I hope you began to catch with, with my simple change of the word, there you may come and there you may worship and there you may eat. I prefer to see this text as a glorious invitation to come and worship the Lord. It represents a wonderful provision for the perpetuation of the extraordinary event at Sinai where Yahweh had personally invite, invited His people into His presence and invited them to rejoice there. Grammatically and syntactically, this text divides into three parts. If you want a three-part sermon, Moses' invitation to worship, verses 2 to 7. Moses' description of the nature of true worship, verses 8 to 12. And Moses' concluding exhortation. After all, he is a preacher. Although this provides us with an exegetical grasp of the passage, I would like to explore the substance of this text by noting the contrast between true and false worship by asking a series of leading questions. First, we need to ask, who is the object of true worship? Our text answers this question with reference to false worship with the barest of details. In verse 2, Moses speaks paraphrastically of the gods of the nations whom the Israelites were to dispossess, but he doesn't identify them by name. Not that they deserve naming, 
For the gods of the nations are the products of the futile imaginations of depraved human minds. They are nothing but physical objects made of wood and stone and then decorated with silver and gold to camouflage the pathetic reality. As Moses had said earlier in 428, they are the work of human hands and though they have the physical organs, they neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. He will even use sharp, he will be even sharper in his criticism in 2916, where he will refer to these lifeless idols as shikutsim and gilulim, a hendiatic phrase for disgusting pellets of excrement. I think actually he means sheep droppings. Those of you who know anything about sheep will, know, will understand those round things. This is how God, here, speaking through Moses, thinks about all the expressions of religious devotion that displace him as the object of worship with humanly inspired or man-made substitutes. By contrast, the Israelites are called to worship the Lord, the living God, who has not only revealed to his people his eternal name, but who has personally established himself as the God of your ancestors. According to chapter 4, this is the God who has graciously revealed His will to the people and in fulfillment of Genesis 17, 7, graciously invited Israel to covenant relationship with Himself. Because He loved the ancestors, He chose their descendants and redeemed Israel from the bondage of Egypt and in so doing demonstrated that He is the one and only God, there is no other. Not only has Yahweh become the personal God of this people, as Moses will declare in 14, 1 to 2, he has adopted them as his sons, set them apart as his holy people, chosen them to be his royal treasure. A starker contrast between Israel's gods, God and the gods of the nations can scarcely be imagined. Second, who are the subjects of true worship? And of course, now I am not talking about subjects in the sense of about whom is worship, but I am using it in the grammatical sense. What kinds of nouns are appropriate subjects to the verb worship? And as far as I know, God never worships. God is never the subject of that. He doesn't need to bow down before anybody. Who does worship? Well, on the one hand, this text speaks, speaks of the nations whom you shall dispossess, whom we know to be the Girgashites and Amorites and Canaanites and Perizzites, etc. Seven nations stronger and greater than you. These are the nations whose worship is an abomination, with whom the Israelites are to make no covenants, show no favor, with whom they are forbidden to marry, for they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods. These are people whose worship... Yahweh abhors. Now, whereas the persons whose worship is rejected are lumped together in one generic expression, Hagoyim, the persons who are invited here to worship are specifically identified. Moses is obviously addressing the heads of households in verse 7 when he refers to the worshipers as you. But he makes it clear immediately that acceptable worship is not restricted to adult males by adding and your household. In verses 12 to 18, he will clarify what he means by household, specifying your son and your daughter, your male and female servant, and the Levite in your town. Throughout his address, Moses perceives Israel as a community of faith that gathers regularly for the worship, for worship in the presence of the Lord. A chosen people in a chosen land gathered at the chosen place for worship, for the worship of one who has graciously chosen each. This is a remarkable statement reminding us all that in the presence of God we are all equal and we all have equal access. When more than a thousand years later, Paul would write that there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, he was not fixing an Old Testament problem. Rather, he was correcting the misogynistic social developments reflected in the intertestamental writings and rabbinic writings and institutionalized in the design of Herod's temple with its separate courts of the women and Gentiles, respectively. 
This kind of social stratification in the assembly of worshipers is foreign to the Old Testament. Moses envisions all the members of the community of faith having equal access to the presence, and we will see later, the table of the Lord. Third, where is the place of true worship? Well, Moses contrasts the place where the pagans worship with the place where true worship is to happen by emphasizing, first of all, that pagans worship at any site on any high hill under every green tree. Now, if you have trouble connecting with your gods and being frustrated with their refusal to answer, you will seek every opportunity in every possible place where a god might be contacted through liturgical means. The emphasis on this plethora of places serves as an important foil against which to interpret the Lord's claim to a single place in verses 5 and 11. In verse 5, we arrive at what could be the most important verse in the chapter and arguably one of the most important for contemporary understanding of the history of Israelite religion. The place that the Lord your God will choose from among all your tribes to put his name there for his dwelling represents the first of 21 occurrences of what we call the place formula in the book of Deuteronomy. And it sets the stage for what follows. What can we learn about this place? Well, first of all, this place is the place that the Lord, the God of Israel, chooses. It's not wherever you like, where the nations do, or wherever they decide it might be, it might help to connect with the gods, but it is where the Lord chooses. This is a great election term in the book. Just as the Lord chooses Levites as priests out of the tribes, He chooses a king from the people to govern Him, and He has chosen Israel out of all the peoples on the earth as the means of fulfilling the patriarchal promise. The same is true of the place that He will choose. In accordance with long-standing ancient Near Eastern tradition, gods select the place where their devotees are to worship. Here, Yahweh the God of Israel announces in advance that he will choose the place. Curiously, he never names the place in the book. Second, the place will be chosen from all your tribes. Actually, the tribes is not a place, and so you have to understand the word tribes as from within your tribal territorial allotments. The issue is Sinai doesn't count anymore. It's within the promised land. There God will choose a place. And again, he gives us no idea as to which tribe is in mind. It would be a mistake, though, to read highly developed Zion theology into Moses' vague reference to the place that Yahweh would choose. But there can be no doubt that in the Lord's mind, who inspires Moses to make these statements, it is, he is thinking about Jerusalem already from the very beginning, uh, even as he will have David in mind when we come to chapter 17 tomorrow. Third, the place will have Yahweh's name on it. This expression speaks of divine ownership. Just as a person who bears the name of Yahweh is recognized as belonging to the Lord, so the place bearing the imprint of his name is recognized as his possession. In this context, the expression serves as the equivalent of the place where the Lord causes people to remember his name, Exodus 20, 24, or the place on which my name is called or read, depending on how you translate that, perhaps a reference to an inscription on the foundation stone of the building. Such inscriptions validated the site as, the chose, as chosen by the one whose name was inscribed. In this case, it would declare the place an efficacious cult locale where the Lord could be worshipped and confidently invoked. To place his name upon signifies the opposite of destroying the names of the Canaanite gods, which he had mentioned in verse 3. Fourth, the place will be a dwelling place for the Lord. Critical scholars have tended to interpret the pronoun as its dwelling, that is, the antecedent being the name, 
as where the name dwells. On this basis, many argue that this place formula reflects a late demythologizing revolution in Israelite religion commonly associated with name theology. Supposedly, whereas P and Ezekiel, the, in P and Ezekiel, the presence of God is presented in anthropomorphic, corporeal, and symbolic terms, the kavod, the glory, Deuteronomy presents a more abstract understanding according to which God himself, God removes himself personally. He doesn't actually dwell in the temple, but he is represented there by his name. But this interpretation is rendered extremely unlikely on three counts. First, contextually, Moses' concern here is not the abstraction of perceptions of deity, contra Weinfeld and others, but the displacement of many pagan cult centers where the names of the gods are inscribed with the establishment of a cult center chosen and authorized by the Lord, the true owner of the entire land. Second, idiomatically, the expression le chakain shmo has reference not to claims of divine presence, but ownership and legitimacy. That's where the Lord puts his stamp with his name on it as authorized place. Third, grammatically, the antecedent for the pronoun on le shikno is best understood as the Lord himself who dwells here, not the name. Accordingly, the concern of the present text is not the demythologizing of Israelite religion, but the establishment of true worship of the one true and living God in the land in this place. But it's not only the plethora of pagan places of worship that is contrasted with the one place where the Lord is to be worshipped. It is also the nature of this place. Moses talks here about all of these cultic appurtenances and installations which are to be destroyed. His disposition is reflected in the verbs he uses to describe how you are to handle the pagan places of worship. The altars are to be ripped down, the sacred pillars smashed, the asherim burned with fire, the images of their gods chopped down. This emphasis on the concrete symbols of divinity at pagan shrines contrasts with the way Moses portrays the place where Yahweh is to be worshipped. Moses says nothing of buildings or images or any cultic objects. Instead, he focuses on the presence of the Lord himself. If the place that the Lord chooses to establish His name is the place where He dwells, then it is natural for Him to describe the location of worship as before the Lord. Before the Lord, which He does twice in verses 7 and 12. God is really there. Elsewhere, Moses does indeed recognize the special status of Levites, whose responsibilities are summarized in 10.8 as they carry the Ark of the Covenant, they stand before the Lord, they serve Him, and they bless in His name. But for the kind of worship he's talking about here, he throws the door wide open to all the members of the community. Access to the Lord is not a privilege reserved for the few. It is for all. The fifth question, what are the characteristics of true worship? Uh, I hurry through simply by summarizing that negatively true worship is not like the nation's worship. You shall not treat the Lord your God this way. And the this way would refer to with all these objects and incense and uh, 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 altars and pillars and all the rest of it like this. But the other thing we need to notice here is the word serve. You shall not serve the Lord your God like they do. What does this mean? Of course, we tend to interpret this serving to involve especially the care and the feeding of the gods. In pagan context, that's what this was about. But of course, the verb to serve has a much broader semantic range, denoting any expression or act of servitude before a person whom one recognizes as one's superior. Do nothing anywhere that expresses your subordination to these gods. 
Accordingly, to serve other gods is to acknowledge their lordship over oneself, which is a direct affront to Yahweh, who has created all humankind and who has redeemed Israel. But secondly, Moses also says in verse 8, you shall not do that which is right in your eyes or as you see. He's hereby saying, implying, I think, there are some things going on with the present community of Israel that are not right. And he says, we're going to stop this. It is not for the worshiper to decide how to worship. It is only for the God who is worshipped to decide. And so he starts to talk about what worship of the Lord should actually look like. Now when we're reflecting on this question, we could go to the book of Deuteronomy as a whole and look at all of the places where you have this place formula, the place that I will choose for my name to dwell, and there are a dozen of them. And I have summarized on your notes what, what happens at these places, and it is rather an exciting uh, 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 collection, isn't it? At the place that the Lord chooses to establish His name, His people may seek the face of the Lord. They may hear the reading of the Torah. They will learn to fear the Lord. They will rejoice before the Lord. They will eat before the Lord. They will present all their sacrifices. They will celebrate the great annual pilgrimage festivals. They will settle legal disputes before the Levitical priest or judge. They will observe uh, Levites serving in the name of the Lord. They will present thanksgiving offerings and recall the Lord's saving and providential grace. They will demonstrate their covenant commitment to the Lord by gifts of charity to the marginalized. And they will demonstrate communal solidarity by celebrating with their children, servants, Levites, and the alien. It is an exciting thing, a collection package of activities and experiences that are to happen before the Lord. But let's come back to this text. What does this text tell us about what happens, worship that is acceptable to God? Our passage is dominated by five verbs. You shall make a pilgrimage to the place. You shall come there, or is it enter? You shall bring your offerings. You shall eat, and you shall rejoice in all your activities. Now, the tone of this paragraph is remarkable, flying in the face of common perceptions of worship in the Old Testament. Moses' paradigm for worship here has five dimensions, each of which has a profoundly positive sense and may be construed more as an invitation than a command. First, Moses invites the Israelites to make regular pilgrimages to the place where the Lord resides. Contrary to most English translations, the Hebrew expression darash el hamakom does not mean either to seek the place, it's the wrong kind of construction for that, or to seek the Lord at the place. In this instance, with the following preposition, Tige is quite right, I think, in saying that this is an idiomatic expression for making pilgrimages to the place to visit the place with spiritual intent. Traditionally, literally, Moses' first challenge reads, on the contrary to the place that the Lord your God will choose, you, may, uh, you shall seek or repair and you may come there. He hereby invites the Israelites regularly to visit the place that the Lord will choose for his residence. Although these verses are usually referred to as the altar law, as I have already indicated, in reality, they represent a gracious initiative by God in providing a way whereby he could continue to relate to his people in the land more or less as he had done at Sinai. This is as much an invitation to continuous and repeated fellowship with him as a command regularly to appear before him. Second, Moses invites the Israelites to come, or is it to enter the place where the Lord resides? And again, most of our translations read, there you shall go. Now that's what you're saying when you're commanding. Take, you start here and you go there. But this is not that kind of language. The perspective is here, is, is, the motion is perceived from the perspective of the person who is the destination. Come. There you may come, rather than the perspective of a person sending one off on a journey. 
Israel is invited to come to the Lord and to enter. And the word bowl can mean not only come, but also enter into his presence. True worship in, occurs in his presence by his invitation. Third, Moses invites the Israelites to bring all their offerings to the place uh, where Yah, the Lord establishes his name. And again, the verb is the same. It's not take your offerings there, but bring your offerings here. And his enthusiasm at this point is reflected in the fact that he lists seven types of offering. Whole burnt offerings, animal sacrifices, tithes, specially dedicated offerings, votive offerings, free will offerings, the firstborn of herds and flocks. Like his listing of the seven nations in chapter 7 verse 1, this catalog is not intended to be exhaustive, but representative. The whole package is to be brought there. On behalf of the Lord, Moses invites the Israelites to come, bring all your offerings to me, speaking for God, at the place I have chosen, knowing that I will accept you. The chosen people offering specially chosen gifts in the place chosen by God. This is the key to maintaining the covenant relationship established at Sinai. Fourth, Moses invites the Israelites to eat there in the presence of the Lord. He brought me to his banquet table. That's what's happening here. This statement is extremely significant on at least three counts. First, as elsewhere in ancient Near Eastern and, biblical, and even biblical counts, eating together was a ritual act of fellowship and communion, often the culminating event of a covenant-making ritual. I am very encouraged that you've invited me to join you in a brown bag lunch. That's communion. Second... Unlike the emphasis in pagan contexts where offerings are presented as food for the gods, in this context, the offerings are food for the worshipers. God doesn't need food. Third, the adverbial modifiers there in the presence of the Lord your God reflect the true nature of his relationship. As the Lord's vassal, Israel is hosted by the Lord. But interesting, does not eat with him. I think maybe we have a picture of this in Psalm 23. You prepare a table before me while my enemies look on. And you spread out the table and my you, you, you fill my cup to overflowing. This is celebration at the table of the Lord. What a privilege. The election of that place provides a way by which the communion Israel experienced at Horeb may be repeated again and again and again in the promised land. And fifth, the Israelites are invited to celebrate the blessing of the Lord on their work. Many Christians today perceive Israelite worship as little more than boring and repetitive and often violent ritual performed by the priest on behalf of the worshiper who stood by passively observing the proceedings. But it's obvious that here with the word samach, that those who hold such views have not read the book of Deuteronomy, for the book, picture that Moses paints here is radic differs radically from that image. It seems that Moses has seized upon a phrase found in the legislation concerning the festival of booths in Leviticus 23, 40. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. And he has now made it normative for regular worship that transpires before the Lord. When you present the tithe, the festival of weeks, the festival of booths, the presentation of first fruits, the celebration of entrance into the promised land, rejoice whenever you come before the Lord. Obviously, this rejoicing is to be a celebration of gratitude for God's favor. Although the privilege of access is extended to all individuals, this worship was not to be individualistic. That's important. It's collective and communal. On the contrary, true worship not only celebrates the vertical relationship, but also manifests itself in horizontal charity toward the marginalized and economically vulnerable. The blessing from God that the worshiper celebrates is to be shared in generosity and blessing of male and female servants, Levites, aliens, orphans, and widows. You have this in other contexts. Our time is more than gone, but let me conclude by reflecting a little bit on the implications this passage might have on how we do worship today. What implications are there here for our own Christian theology of worship? 
Well, in large mem measure, the reasons many churches today are splitting over forms of communal worship may be found in the relative paucity of direct guidance that the New Testament provides. I mean, we want to be New Testament churches. The only trouble is, and I don't need to tell my New Testament colleagues here, the only trouble is the New Testament doesn't give us much specific instruction on how to do church. That is, the cultic gathering. Nowhere does the New Testament tell us to build churches, to meet on Sundays, to have morning worship services, to open with a song and a prayer, to have a long sermon, and then to close with a benediction. It doesn't tell us to do any of that. About the only custom it prescribes is, as a regular occurrence is participation in the Lord's Supper which is eaten in the presence, in remembrance of Christ's saving work and in anticipation of the great eschatological meal in the presence of God Himself. Remarkably, this, except for those of you from the Brethren and Plymouth Brethren tradition, this is the one liturgical worship rite that the New Testament describes, but we treat as optional or occasional or random. We squabble over everything else and neglect the weightier matters of the gospel. The crisis in the contemporary evangelical church arises from the woeful absence of a biblical theology of worship. If true worship actually involves reverential act, human acts of submission and homage before the divine sovereign in response to his gracious revelation of himself and in accordance with his will, and that is uh, kind of, it's not a definition, you can't define, well you can define the words for worship worship, but it's an, an attempt to clarify what worship is or does. If that is an accurate definition, then we had better start asking what his will is, specifically with respect to reveral, referential acts of submission and homage. Have you ever noticed that the two things, both the Hebrew and the Greek words for worship primarily, proskunao and hishtachoa, prostrate oneself. These are, the, these are the things we are not allowed to do in our churches. A text like Deuteronomy may begin to help us along the way. What lessons on worship can we learn here? First, very quickly. The only legitimate object of worship is the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth, the God of Israel, and the redeemer of humankind through the divine incarnate Son, Jesus Christ. All other objects of worship are not only illegitimate, they are shikutzim and gilulim. Second, the only persons who may worship God legitimately are the redeemed. Those whom God has brought from bondage in the kingdom of darkness and ushered into the realm of his marvelous light. There is but one form of worship that unbelievers may legitimately participate in, prostration before the holy God and pleas for mercy, as you have it in Luke 18. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Third, true worship involves an audience with the divine king. We come at his terms by his invitation in his time. Some of you are aware that my roots are Canadian. We, do, we still do recognize the crown of Queen Elizabeth. I imagine sometimes what it would be like if the queen would invite me for an audience with her. I tell you, I would prepare for a month reading every possible book uh, I could get my hands on, on proper protocol in the presence of Her Majesty. And I would, once I get into her presence, I wouldn't dare open my mouth until A, she had finished speaking, and B, she had invited me to talk. Ultimately, it is not up to the worshipers, least of all unregenerate and carnal, to determine the forms and standards of worship. Entrance into the presence of God is an incredible privilege to be accepted with humility and awe. Fourth, in true worship, the location is less important than the presence of the divine host. We noticed in this text already that it's always vaguely at the place where I cause my name to dwell. It never names the place, but it's the presence of God. 
We tend to interpret Jesus' words to the Samaritan woman in John 4 as radical and revolutionary. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, as if those are places. For the Father is seeking such people to worship, and God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Whatever else spirit and truth means, it must surely involve worship that is driven by the regenerating and animating work of the Spirit of God and that has integrity, by which we mean performed in accordance with the truth of God and His expectations of us as He reveals them. As Stephen suggests in Acts 7, 47 to 50, Israel's spiritual pilgrimage took a wrong turn when they lost sight of the divine resident and became preoccupied with the residents. If we were to ask Moses, he would tell us that it's never been about the residents. It's the resident. This does not mean that the place for us is irrelevant. It just means that it is not of utmost importance. Fifth, the redeemed anticipate worship with both joy and delight. On the one hand, the fact that God has redeemed us and, prov and provided for us a way of worship and that He would invite us to Himself is an incredible grace. And it's in this context I wish we had time to read the first part of Psalm 95. On the other hand, with this privilege comes an awesome responsibility to acknowledge our unworthiness, to come before Him, and to recognize that when we worship, what He has to say is always more important than what we have to say to Him. This is reflected in the last part of Psalm 95. Sixth, true public worship is communal rather than private. There is a place for private basking in the presence of God. But when God's people gather for corporate worship, they gather to bring collective praise to God. And I wish that we would get rid of first-person singular pronouns in our corporate worship. It's about we, not me. It used to be said that 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning is the most segregated hour of the week. Well, we've made a little, not nearly enough progress on the base. For the most part, we were talking about race issues. I'm convinced that the 11 o'clock hour is still the more, most segregated hour of the week, but for other reasons. Whenever we have a split, or whenever we have split services on the basis of race or age or musical tastes, I am convinced... The devil has us exactly where he wants us because we have declared to the world that it is not possible for young people and old people to worship together. True worship is communal, not individualistic. May the Lord teach us all how to worship him in spirit and in truth. May we respond to the Lord's gracious invitation to come into His presence. May we come as households together celebrating the grace of God. May the Lord receive our worship because we offer it to the praise of His glory and the glory of His wonderful name. And may He, in the midst of this, edify us for His glory. We ask through Christ our Lord. Amen.